Hi, and welcome everybody to another edition of The Safety View. Um, we've got a great conversation in store for us today. We have Michael Hartley, and Michael Hartley is the founder and CEO of uh, Mattel, and he's going to be discussing with us measuring performance. So we're going to be looking specifically at how ESG functions, including health and safety, can measure and communicate performance rather than just simply doing reporting. So Michael, why don't you hop on with us and give us a little bit of an introduction and then we'll open up the topic. Great, Tamara, thanks so much for, for having me. Um, yeah, good, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, to whenever you're listening to this. Uh, yeah, so as uh, Tamara alluded to, my name is uh, Michael Hartley. Uh, so I, I founded Mintel uh, about four years ago, um, and we are a risk management technology company based in Toronto. We service medium and large size goods uh, industries in the goods producing sectors. So think energy, think um, construction, manufacturing, food production, uh, and, and we help them answer two fundamental questions uh, in risk management. What is our current ESG risk exposure? and how effective are our controls uh, at any one moment in time. Uh, a bit of background on me, I spent 10 years in oil and gas in the North Sea and the Caspian Sea. Uh, and it was in the Caspian Sea that Mintel was, was actually uh, created. Uh, I was responsible for all the health, safety, environmental risks on the offshore component of what was at the time the world's largest project. Uh, we had 6,200 people working offshore, 40 you know, 40 different nationalities, 20 different languages, a very challenging environment. And we got wind that, uh, we got word that uh, Deepwater Horizon had exploded in the Gulf of Mexico. And when our installation manager came to me and said, you know, could this eventually happen to us? I couldn't definitively say no. And, and, and that's when I knew at that time that we needed to change the way we measured and communicated risk and performance information. And that was really the day that that Mintel was conceived. Uh, and from that point, I, I went into uh, mining and risk management as an enterprise risk manager with a large gold mining company uh, based here in Canada. And then had the opportunity to, to step out, start this business uh, and supporting clients um, across, the, across, North, across the Americas uh, and in Central Asia as well to really try and answer those two fundamental questions. What's our current risk exposure and how effective are our controls right now? Wonderful. So thank you. It, what does ESG uh, stand for? Yeah, it, it stands for environmental and uh, social governance. Uh, so this is what uh, has been labeled now, uh, what you would have heard of as uh, sustainability for maybe two or three years ago, uh, co uh, corporate social responsibility of maybe five or 10 years ago. Uh, and so this is when we think about risk, and, and I'm going to, to talk about run a lot of these topics through the lens of risk management, because I feel it's, it's such an important area to, to focus on naturally as a risk management company. Uh, and, and so environmental social governance, that's all the risks that uh, are associated with a, an, an operation, as I talked about, a typically complex, safety critical, tightly coupled uh, in, in, those, in those type of industries. That's not pure uh, operational, so throughput, output, or um, financial. Right? The financial is very well regulated. The operational one is, 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 is very well managed at the, at the moment. But that ESG, that's where we have a lot of, um, uh, shall we say, mystery in terms of what is the actual performance of organizations in this space? We see a lot of results, uh, but for us, we see reporting results as the floor, not as the ceiling. And there's so much more room to, 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 grow, this, uh, to grow this area, to be able to demonstrate value for, for stakeholders, both internally and externally. I actually created a poll uh, to find out if people are using ESG in their organizations or not right now. So when you want that poll, let me know. Uh, so it was the question to me, uh, Tamara. Either you or Rosa. I'll let oh, Rosa, I'll let Rosa introduce me, it. 
Let's see. Go ahead. Yeah, because I know Rosa, you love your polls. So I love polls. Let's see where polls, so where people are right now. There you go. If everybody can kind of mention answer that, and then that kind of gives us a feel <laughs> of oh wow, yeah, three people. Okay. This is great. So we got a bit of a mixture in here. Mm -hmm. Right? We got eight of eight people. The last two. Oh, wait, maybe that's us. Okay, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Can you see the results? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so I'm just going to read it out because it won't get on the recording. So I asked, uh, we use uh, ESG in our organization. And so uh, we've got 75 people, 75% 75 of people in the room said yes, and 25% said no. So that's where people are in the room right now. And I think if we were to conduct that poll two years ago, the, the numbers would be flipped. It would probably be 25% say yes, and 75% saying no. It, 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 the, the, the vernacular has, has accelerated very, very quickly here. Uh, over the past couple of years. And so mm -hmm. it's it's very much a, a well understood uh, term or sorry, well known term. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, its understanding is perhaps a little bit more uh, in question, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of uh, being able to articulate how well my organization is performing in this space, this is where we focus on helping, uh, helping in multiple industries. Um, how does sustainability tie in with risk? Well, uh, as I said, that sustainability or ESG is that third bucket uh, of, yes. of risk. And, uh, you know, if we kind of take a step back and ask ourselves, well, what are the functions that are contributing to sustainability? Uh, you know, safety and health, environment, uh, community relations, uh, security, there are others uh, as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. And... It's, it's one thing to, to know that we've got all these, we're, we're doing a lot of work and people are busy and we've got a, you know, a, a swelling headcount. Well, that doesn't really tell us how we're actually performing and whether we can give the market that confidence and comfort that we are creating and sustaining mm -hmm. value and that the, the work that we do, the results that we achieve are being done so in a safe, repeatable and sustainable way. Uh, so sustainability um, relates more to um, the sustainability of the operation, because I've always thought of sustainability, uh, the way I think about it, because I'm not an expert, is we're looking at what's sustainable in the environment for the continuation of the planet. Are, is that a different use of the word sustainable? Uh, no, I, th I think it, it lines up with a lot with what a lot of organizations are are being asked to communicate now, what is the purpose of our organization beyond the financial rewards? Uh, and are we able to demonstrate that we are doing what we say in terms of delivering on that purpose? Um, Eric Fink, uh, for, oh, sorry, Larry Fink, pardon me. I see, I saw Eric on the, uh, in, in one of the windows. Hi there. Uh, Larry Fink, for, uh, the, the CEO of BlackRock, uh, they have $10 trillion of assets under management. Uh, this is a person whose phone calls gets returned by CEOs. Uh, he has not just um, nudged, but demanded that CEOs, in the, particularly in those industries that are going to be responsible for decarbonization, uh, not only uh, articulate what their purpose is, but demonstrate that purpose through the use of data analytics. And uh, this is a, a, a big sea change for a lot of organizations who were very content to produce a report at the end of the year and then point to that and say, hey, look how much money we've spent or look how many people that we've got uh, under that sustainability umbrella. That's no longer, those results, uh, those high level results uh, are, 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 are no longer acceptable to the Larry Finks of the world um, as they are no longer acceptable to local communities, as they're no longer acceptable to um, a, a millennial money manager um, you know, based in Singapore. Well, that's good news for the planet. Well, we, we don't have it. We don't have, really have an option, uh, frankly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I think from, from where we're sitting, um, and, and where we need to, to shift the, the, the big change that we need to see in risk management 
is move away from just reporting results to measuring performance. And the way I can articulate that from a safety perspective is we need to move away from just focusing on incident management, what happened, to risk management. And we need to focus and, and be able to, to really measure and communicate what's happening. Because the, the, the ability to do the, to, to do the latter, the measure and communicate what's happening, gives a much more context rich, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's much deeper uh, information that we can have much more transparent dialogue with our internal decision makers and external stakeholders uh, as, as we move uh, and, and progress our organizations uh, to mm -hmm. deliver against those purposes. Uh, so I, I see, see Suzanne has their hand up. Suzanne? Yeah, hi. Um, you know, Michael, I, you know, our initial conversations a while ago, you, you know, sort of taught me a lot. I've been curious about this um, for a while now, since I've seen a previous manager of mine move into this role. And I do find that these roles seem to be filled not with safety people, um, uh, but I, I've been giving it some thought and as, as I look at my organizations, what they put out for sustainability reporting nowadays, um, one of the things I've recognized is we can't report incident rates using local provincial statistics because this is a, this is a whole world, it's a global thing. So we settle on reporting to a certain injury standard and in Canada as you know oil and gas the cap standard is used by a lot of organizations but the cap standard categorizes injuries in a certain way it, it emphasizes some injuries and it de-emphasizes other injuries and so there's always that social it, it, it's a filter and it's I think as maybe not taking us in that injury prevention way that would be helpful. But when you roll it all together and it's just one thing, I can see uh, how it, it, why it's, it's still there, but I'm just struggling with that cap standard a lot lately. I don't know if you have any reflection on that. Uh, I do, in fact. Um, so I think when it comes to uh, mandate, like, where, where there's uh, legislation that mandates how reports must be uh, communicated, I would say do it and get it done, right? And, and unfortunately, we're, we're unable to look too much into those because we can't get a lot out of it. Uh, and so it's really the, 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 the tip of the iceberg. What I wanna look at is underneath the water at, at performance. Again, this is moving away from just reporting results to measuring performance. So I would wanna know um, what are my top 10 risks yeah, for, for every function. What are the controls that I have in place? And most companies would be able to answer those first two questions. But then the third question is, how effective are those controls right now? Right. And that's where a lot of companies would really struggle to be able to answer. And this is where we can uh, leverage data to be able to answer those questions. So I think if you've got a reporting standard, go and do it. Uh, but give us the performance. It's really the, if anyone's helped a 10 year old with their math homework, uh, you can have the right answer, but if you can't show your work, you don't get full marks. I see Eric has his hand up. Nice hey. segue, Michael. Very good. <laughs> yeah, no, I, if you guys see me banging away, I'm not sending emails. I'm just taking notes. I wish I had a better memory, but I don't, unfortunately. Uh, one, one question was, it's a twofold question. Uh, one is around Larry. Can you, can you please share who Larry was again, his role, yeah, like what uh, kind of stakeholder he was? Uh, Larry Fink, uh, he's the CEO of BlackRock. Okay. Uh, and so BlackRock has, uh, is a major uh, fund manager um, and they they have a significant stake in a lot of industries that are responsible for stewarding and growing uh, the decarbonization economy. He just did a letter, didn't he, to the public? He always does. Yeah, he, he does. He, he does multiple letters per year, but he has an annual letter to CEOs. Yeah. Um, and it was his annual letter two years ago or three years ago uh, that really focused on uh, on purpose 
and being able to demonstrate how that purpose is being achieved. Okay, let me try to find that letter and put it in the chat for people. And Eric, your second point. Uh, do you know what it ended up fleeting me, but it, it'll, it'll come up. Uh, that's fine. That was helpful, though. It helps provide context for, um, for, the, for that prior story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric, you also submitted a question, didn't you? Yeah, uh, I did. And I, it was, I think, primarily around the social component. I wish I wrote it. It was, I, I, I'm having trouble remember it, actually. Did you have it anywhere, Tamara? Yeah, by any chance? I have it. I've, I've got you. Uh, what are some of the simple social KPIs and indicators that are robust enough to begin to work towards benchmarking the S in ESG. Yeah, and I think I touched on that with uh, my, my response to, to Suzanne. Uh, so if safety and health falls under the, the S piece internally, uh, from an internal context standpoint, then I just don't want to know, you know, what my injury rate is, what my fatality rate is. Uh, and and don't, don't go down the track of, of giving metrics that uh, can succumb to the good arts, to, you know, failing to good arts law. I'll give you an example. So good arts law is states that when a metric becomes a target, it ceases to become a useful metric, mm -hmm. right? And we've all got those. We all know what those look like. Uh, and an example that I, I, I can, uh, I've often cite is a, a company that I did some work with um, a few years ago. Uh, they said, okay, you know, here's what we communicate out to, out to the market. It was their fatality rate. It was their injury rate. And it was the number of safety conversations that they had across their organization, right? And, you know, the, the figure was 210,000 uh, safety conversations as a, a, a global, global organization, right? So two things struck me about that third metric. Uh, one, that it was a suspiciously round figure for uh, an entire organization over the course of a year. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm kind of instantly uh, not buying it. Uh, but then secondly, what's the value, right? If you have more of those, are you a better organization? If you have fewer of those, are you, are you a better organization? Are you a worse organization? And so really it was a, a metric for metrics sake. And again, this is the difference between incident reporting, measuring what happened versus risk management, measuring what's happening. You know, we want to be able to demonstrate our capability to manage not demonstrate our capacity to administer. And unfortunately, safety has succumbed to the administration, the, the bureaucracy uh, um, end of that spectrum. Uh, and and you know, I really challenged this individual to, you know, to, to find a way to, to kick that into touch and find a much more progressive metric that is giving us a sense of how well are we doing on those things that are, uh, are most important to minimizing our exposure to unacceptable risk, right? Because at the end of the day, that's how we're gonna create value. I know we're gonna touch on the value piece here. We're gonna create and sustain value for, you know, for, for, for organizations uh, by um, eliminating that exposure to unacceptable ESG risks, right? We're never gonna have, we're never gonna eliminate exposure to uh, ESG risk. Managing ESG risk is part of how companies differentiate themselves from their peers. But what we can do is we can eliminate that unacceptable exposure, right? Exposure to unacceptable risks. And that is a huge uh, uh, distinction between saying, well, we're gonna de-risk this, whatever that means. And, and that's just a, a term that gets thrown around uh, you know, quite flippantly versus, no, we know what our top risks are. Uh, we know what controls that we have that are mitigating those risks. And we can determine when those risks, that, that exposure becomes unacceptable because that, we now have that capacity to, to systematically intervene. Mm -hmm. I, I see that Tamara, you have your hand up, but can I just do a follow-up question because you did mention one of my favorite topics, conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and okay, so I agree with you. Once you start measuring the number of conversations, people typically just start handing in a form that says they had a conversation, regardless of whether they actually did or not. 
Um, but what would be a way to uh, sense the way people communicate? Do you have any suggestions mm -hmm. as to how to measure what is actually happening versus what already did? What do you tell your clients? Yeah, one word that is so, it's the most important word in risk management. It's context. Okay. If you can drive contextually rich discussions between uh, supervisor, workforce, manager, whatever layer and within layers uh, as well, then you are going to have much, much better conversations. What do I mean by context in this, in, in this state, in this sense? So I want to know context is, is driven by task, it's driven by location, it's driven by you know, individual uh, as well. So if a manager comes to me and says, hey, we're seeing that there's an, a couple of issues here with regards to X, right? And if, if, that, if, that, um, uh, if that observation is coming from the, the, the workforce, I'm gonna have a much more, I'm gonna have much more respect for that individual and I'm gonna uh, engage in a much deeper conversation. If we think about, you know, a politician coming around and, and, and door knocking, right? You know, they say, hey, you know, I want to talk to you about my vision of, you know, 2050. I said, you know what? I've got uh, kids here that I've got to take care of. I'm, I'm, I've already switched off the conversation. But if she were to come to me and say, hey, I understand that there's a couple issues uh, around, you know, this particular school and, you know, the road works and, you know, down on, on this particular street. Well, all of a sudden, I'm much more inclined to be engaged to, to, to speak with that individual and to listen and to, you know, to, to have that exchange. So this is where data plays a, a very significant role in being able to drive context uh, at the local discussion points, right? At those decision points, right? And, and for us, our mission is to make risk information accessible and useful, both for decision makers, but also for those external stakeholders. So having those data available uh, really drives those high value discussions. I don't care how many you have, but if you're, if you're using the data, then there's going to be a, a much better uptake from both sides of the, that, that discussion, uh, Diane. That's interesting. Yeah, so maybe, are you, uh, is this a correct um, uh, <clears throat> assumption that if you are going to collect information from those conversations, it would be good to collect data on the topics that are surfacing. So then people are forced to um, think about those particular and then the and those would be data driven, right? So would that make the conversations more helpful, or the data that you collect regarding the conversations? Is yeah. That so, so, so I would keep it focused on what's critical, right? And and what's most important are the the, the critical controls that mitigate uh, material unwanted events. Okay. You keep the conversation focused at that level because too many times we've seen that uh, you know. There's a, you know, safety talk campaign or safety conversation campaign. We've all seen this and it drives down to the bottom of the food chain where it's about housekeeping and PPE, right? Mm -hmm. And that's pointless. Uh, where you need to keep that focus is on what's critical. And, you know, that story about Deepwater Horizon, I'm sure that you all know uh, that, uh, you know, there were you know, two uh, executives from BP who owned the rig, two executives from, um, uh, from Transocean, who operated the rig, who went offshore that day for the sole purpose to give the management and crew of Deepwater Horizon a safety award. They gave them the safety award for seven years of good performance, and they left and the platform exploded. Well, the conversations they were having were about walkway integrity, not well integrity, but because that's what they were measuring perform. That that's how they were measuring performance. It was around you know, low level LTIs, slips, trips and falls, hands and fingers. Uh, and, and this is where we need to shift away to a performance thinking approach to ESG risk management, rather than, you know, a, a, an absolute number of incidents, um, regardless of severity. That, that's, that is such dated thinking, uh, but it's really tough to, to, to move that needle. Yeah. Tamara, did you still want to ask your question? Yeah, I, I do. Um, you know, now this this um, ESG is is a fairly new area for me. So um, you may have already mentioned it, and I haven't picked it up. So repetition is how we learn, right? right. Um, so 
I, I get the E and I, I get the S. It's the G, the governance piece that sometimes kind of leaves me amiss. And like, I understand like governance is basically how we are managing our risks within like the health, the safety environment, et cetera, right? Um, my question is, is that um, I, I hear a lot of, of the wording around being fit for work and that how, how it, it involves our mental well-being. So how do we kind of fit this also into that piece about looking after people's mental well-being under the ESG umbrella? Because well, that, that is a very important topic, especially right now. Okay, and just a sort of quick uh, distinction in, in terminology. Um, fit for work and fit for duty are, are two different things. Uh, yeah. Fit for duty is a, is a daily thing. And fit for work is I, I, can, uh, I can start, the, I can do this job. Fit for duty is I can do this job today. Okay. Uh, and, okay. and so I, I would just slightly, uh, again, a terminology piece, look around fit for duty. Okay. But you, you know, do we have a competent, healthy uh, people right. you know, in an environment that is safe, repeatable, and sustainable? Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. and so it, it absolutely is important to be able to have that and demonstrate that assurance that you know people that are coming into the into the workplace are fit and healthy and competent um, and and healthy takes on you know multiple different uh, definitions uh, I'm not impaired uh, you know impaired is you know fatigue uh, stressed etc there's yeah. there's a there's a number of uh, definitions around uh, around impairment so so again being able to to, to have that you know, that demonstration of assurance and not just say oh well we had an incident therefore we're going to go and look at whether that individual was was fit or not um, that's again a, a really dated approach to uh, you know to, to 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 risk management it's it's again it's at the the other end of the spectrum around trying to measure what happened so how do we bring it to the to the other the other side of the spectrum then? Like yeah, how so, do because I, I really believe, especially being from retail, mental fitness for work is so important, especially for those individuals who are in direct um, contact with the public, right? And so I'm just wondering, like what what about health and safety professionals in those areas? What what should they be thinking about? Well, I think um, the the pandemic has all given us a has given risk managers a, a, a wonderful gift, uh, and, and I'm not being flippant, but this is an opportunity to to really look at uh, what risk management looks like uh, for for the lay public. Right, COVID is a hazard; it presents a risk. We put controls in place. We want to know how well those controls uh, are, are are working. Right. And so for the, the situation that you have with the fit for duty employee um, is how are we what, what tests are we are, are, are we engaging in to provide that reasonable assurance that they are they're, they're, they're not they're not impaired in any way, shape or form. And they're mentally and physically uh, fit to, to execute their responsibilities on that day. Does anybody so else want to ask a question? Yeah, I was kind of just going to roll off that, Tamara. <clears throat> so basically, Michael, the point you kind of drove home towards the end there, it's kind of like that structured plan procedure kind of policy when you're looking at fit for duty. The governance piece kind of helps ascertain that for people looking at your company to say their employees are competent and um, they're also uh, not impaired, they're healthy. But additionally, like, how are you doing that? So then you'll be like, well, part of our governance portion is what you just said. Yeah, and I think, yes. So just to elaborate on that, uh, Eric, thanks for, you know, thanks for introducing that. If we, if we look at the, the hierarchy, it's typically you know, policy standards and procedures. So let's just focus on the, you know, the policies and the standards piece, right? That is a company's way of articulating what it does, right? And, and they've got to be able to demonstrate that they actually do what they say. Uh, so if the articles of your policy are going to read something along the lines of, uh, we're going to keep our people uh, free from um, exposure to unacceptable ESG risks, well, then you need to have the data that, that back that up. 
we are, encourage a, a safe and healthy workplace, um, you know, where, where people come in and, you know, deliver a purpose and leave with a sense of accomplishment. But we would need to see what that, what that looks like uh, as well. And the, there, there can be data around that. Uh, the, the problem with a lot of policies is they are, I mean, they're, you know, various forms of solving world hunger. Uh, and there's no way to demonstrate that you're able to uh, achieve those things, right? And and this mm. is where going back to Larry Finke saying, no, no, be very specific and pithy about your purpose, and then be prepared to use data to demonstrate that you're achieving that. I see. So essentially, from an ESG perspective, someone adopting ESG within their organization, their policies and standards would be more uh, conscious of the someone asking them the five whys almost around something in particular. So rather than saying, well, we're going to donate X amount of our money to help solve world hunger. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, are you solving world hunger? Like define that. Like, how are you solving yeah. world hunger? And X, how do you know your portion of food is actually making an impact given the total income you make? Like, is this a real contribution? Or are you just flipping your numbers here? Am I on the poll here with what people yeah, are going to start asking with ESG? And, and this is the difference between uh, output, mm -hmm. outcome, and effect, Ooh. right? And, and that's a really important distinction to make because a lot of people uh, mix those up, use them interchangeably and say, okay, well, you know, we, we've, we've got an output safety conversations, therefore it's had the desired effect without being able to make that link, right? And, and the, what, we, what we help organizations do is say, okay, well, let's step back and, and talk about the inputs that are gonna give us that output and the process, how we're going to capture those data, you know, what data do we capture? That's really, really important, kind of the four A's of, of risk management. Are we accounting for the right things? Um, and then, you know, do we take, um, you know, do we take the, the right actions? You know, the, as you kind of move down the, you know, the data uh, uh, information, knowledge and insight, that kind of business intelligence model, Right. You need to make sure that you're, again, counting for the right things, taking the right actions. You can assess that, and then you, you, you can make that uh, distinction as to whether you're having the desired effect or not. Michael, um, on our show here, we're not putting you on the spot as having all the answers, but I like to explore something that is uh, very, very difficult uh, on this topic, which is that so many of the things that um, go uh, into creating, a, for example, mental health or you know the total well-being of employees are our human emotions, uh, the interactions, the daily interactions, the way people speak to each other, treat each other, and these things are very difficult to measure. Uh, a lot of the things it seems to me that a lot of the things that make excellence for excellence performance team, for example, psychological safety, right? Well, how do you? How are you going to um, measure things that are basically intangible? What? And I'm throwing this out to the whole group. Yeah. And you've probably been thinking about this. So could you kick us off in what direction you're thinking right now? Yeah, and, and I, I don't have the answer to. Uh, we don't expect so psychological safety because that's a, it, It's tough. I've got some ideas around that, but I think where where we talk about. Um, performance metrics and cultural metrics, mm -hmm. right? I wanna know as a leader that my people are engaged on really important stuff, yeah? That we're taking the right action and, the, the, and that those actions are effective, right? And we can generate data on those things. And so if I've got, if I know my, my risk exposure, I've got my control effectiveness, I'm engaging with people who are doing the work yeah, and then we can also measure what the engagement is like. Are we taking again the, the are we taking the right action? So are we intervening on the you know the, on the right issues? And then when we take those actions, we can see that it's having the desired effect, right? So yeah. it is improving control performance. It's minimizing uh, risk exposure. Though that information is a much better platform to have conversations with and and kind of build that. That, that foundation for, for psychological safety within an organization, because mm -hmm. I now have the capacity to listen, right? Listen to my, uh, to, to my workforce, you know, machines, equipment, systems. I know how well these things are, are working or aren't working. 
I've got the capacity to intervene systematically. So this is not just a, you know, see something, say something, which is, you know, a, a bit of an overused trope, right? Yeah, and reporting the, your misses. And then I've got the capacity to, misses. Yeah. yeah, and then I've got the capacity to inform mm -hmm. and, and inform those discussions, inform, you know, external stakeholders as well. So to, to help move an organization down that path of creating that psychological safety, uh, I would really focus on those three, what we call the three leading indicators in risk management is around um, engagement, action, uh, and, and uh, the effectiveness of those actions. So there's, there's, there's a, a comment that came in from Ken, and then I see Joe's got his hand up. Uh, Ken, I'm just reading it uh, here. For safety conversation, we try to focus on observations more on risk behavior, good or undesirable versus conditions unless the condition was created by a behavior. Do you want to elaborate on that? Have I, have I touched on that? Well, you, yeah, you were talking about the uh, safety conversations and then we got back into some more of the ESG and the safety part of it. But on the conversations, you know, we all know that behaviors drive the, uh, the risk that can occur. And as such, at our company, we have been trying to, you know, really push having a conversation, number one, but looking at, you know, the behavior that's taking place, good or bad, desirable or undesirable, mm -hmm. and speaking to them. Because you got a lot of short service employees in the oil industry yeah. right now. Yeah. And so if you don't show them what good looks like, then they're not going to get better. And then I was just saying, push that instead of the paper on the ground, water bottle thrown in oh, the Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Those kind of cheesy, just get a card in for the day, you know. Yeah. We yeah. don't want that. And then to, to answer your uh, psychological safety, Rosa, I think an organization really has to push their purpose, mission, vision, and values from the beginning. And then yeah. your, your, your mission, of course, has to be casted by the vision of your leaders. And then <clears throat> your, your values that you're living by as a company can't just be iterated words. You know, ours are safety, but then you go, from safety, we go into, we care and explain a little more about what safety and caring about each other means. And then teamwork, you know, you can have those one word bullets, but then expound on those and then talk to those every day and every safety meeting, we have those posted and we discuss how things interact with which value and whatnot. And I think that brings about a, I'm part of something bigger than myself. I'm not just somebody who's pulling slips my attributions are actually helping the organization on a bigger level. And that creates some uh, inspiration, not just motivation, intrinsic, and helps in that psychological safety that the organization is behind you. It's, it's a, you know, it's a cultural part. It, it is. Yeah. Well said, Ken. I think one of the things that I, I missed hearing, uh, and pardon me if I did miss it, was around objectives. Right, because once we can clearly articulate what our objectives are that relate back to our mission, uh, mission, uh, purpose, vision, uh, then we can take a risk management approach to assuring that we've got systems in place that help us achieve those objectives. If we if we look at the ISO definition of risk management, it, it's or of risk. Pardon me. It, it's the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Right. Uh, and, and so being able to manage that uncertainty to, for us to be able to deliver those objectives. Yeah, you, you're, you're bang on. Um, yeah, thanks for that contribution. That was really good. Uh, Joe had his, uh, had his hand up and then uh, Philip. Okay, um, I, I'd like you to explain a little bit more about some of the controls that you are uh, measuring, how the effectiveness of the controls. Uh, do you do it, you start out with, uh, uh, doing a culture survey. Um, could, it's obviously, it's much more than just using, you know, statistical measurements of how well people are following procedures through observations. Could you tell me a little bit more about your point number three about effectiveness of controls? Yeah, yeah, and it's really important because this is where a lot of companies start to fall down, right? Uh, hey, we, we, we've, got, we've got a lot of controls in place. We're doing a lot of stuff. We're, we're busy. So therefore, <laughs> you know, things must be working. Right, but um, a, a control needs to have an objective. Why does that control exist? 
right? And then we find ways what we call components. And these are um, specific uh, com well, components of that uh, control that help us test whether that control's objective is being met, yes or no, right? And this could be um, through automated data. Uh, so, you know, Fan X uh, operates at an RPM of Y over the course of uh, 24 hours at 98%, just kind of picking a, a, a technical, technical control. Uh, but it could also be administrative, right? If we think about it, and the, the easiest one I'll, I'll go back to is around, um, no, you know, I'm not gonna use that one, that, that one's rubbish. Um, so if, if we, if we think around, uh, you know, an administrative component of, of a control is, is that control a repeatable control for the task that we are executing, right? And this is never going to be a binary yes, no, right? There, there's going to be some, some gradation in that. And, you know, so there we can engage with, with people who are, who are using this control on a day-in, day-out basis and, Get a sense from them as to is this always working? Is it mostly sometimes or or rarely? And then if we can collect those data together, we can then paint the picture as to how well this control is is operating. Yeah, and is it having its desired effect on the risk that it uh, proposes to mitigate? Did that uh, uh, help answer your question, Joe? Uh, yes, I I, I think uh, you know I can see times of. Um... Uh, observations to how often people are using some of the human performance error reduction tools, such as, you know, stop, <coughs> act, review, uh, how we see people, whether they take shortcuts and lock out, tag out. Uh, we can see how well the managers perhaps uh, emphasize the, the mission, vision, and values. In other words, uh, we don't want you to take the shortcuts because we, we value your your safety over the production and stuff. So yeah, you gave me a good idea. Thanks very much, Michael. Okay, cheers, Joe. Philip. Philip's on mute. And, and Suzanne, I'm going to come back to you after. Uh, uh, I'm off now. Is it? Oh, there we go. All right. Yeah, sorry. Hello, Philip. Um, I, I was going to just two, two points really. Very quickly, um, Ken said about values and and I've, I've got this fixation that values are shared values. They can't be imposed by, by an organization. And, and I've, I've struggled in a, a multicultural organization to, to understand what the real values of the organization are. Managerially, they have some espoused values, but from a worker level, uh, it, it's a real challenge. So I, we keep talking about this, but you know, values values are they're supposed to be shared. They're they are what create an organization. The 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 imposed values do not create the culture. In my mind, the, okay. sorry. The second point. The second okay. point was, um, you I I came in late. I apologize. I was on another call. Um, You're talking about one of the metrics was was about use of procedures, um, and and you using the measure from observations. Am I correct in that? Um, was it the response I just gave to, to Joe now, just now, or, or from before? Yeah, that's where that's where it came from. Where I where it came from. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let, let me touch on the on the first point because I think um, what we need to be cognizant of is where we have a goal conflict, um, and if we can identify those areas of goal conflict, where in order to get the job done. I have to you know, circumvent our, uh, you know, our controls or go against the values, the stated values of the organization. That's where we need to have the, you know, the, the hand go up. Um, and yeah, I'm not professing that we've got a, a, a technical solution that's gonna, that's gonna get that every single time. However, we go back to those data-driven conversations you know, we can start to, you know, to have that, you know, on the back of that conversation, say, hey, you know, was there anything, you know, dangerous or was there anything that didn't make any sense or was difficult, uh, you know, to try and tease out those, uh, th th those goal conflicts. Um, and, and 
on the second point around uh, around procedures. Procedure is uh, is not a control. It's it, it's a you know it's a piece of paper, right? And a, a procedure outlines how the various controls uh, should be uh, operated or executed. Uh, and so, really, where a, a good organization would be able to have uh, the the identified the the controls, uh, the various components, and what those performance requirements are within those uh, within those uh, within those procedures. So, yeah, I'm not sure if I answered um, either so, of those. Yeah, I, uh, I think spot my, on, but... my my question really came from it was the link with. The observations you talked about, well, for, for me, an observation is um, as being as someone who has been observed. Um, when when you're being observed, you do the very best you can. You make sure you uh, follow all the rules. Yeah. You work to rule effectively. Yeah, which is very different to normal work. And I, I, you know, pr procedures procedures are not followed on a daily basis. Normal work. Would not be done. Would not be exactly. completed. Yeah. If uh, so, so what we need to be looking at the, the data that we need to be gathering is associated with the the actual work, how it's done, and identifying the gap between the the work as imagined and work as done, and and collecting that data and that evidence. And I'm not quite sure how how best to do it. Well, Phil, we're, we're on a path to doing two things, um, uh, quantifying drift, right? And quantifying deviance, which is basically the same thing, right? Same so thing, yeah. you know, we, we, we talk about normalization of deviance, uh, Diane Vaughn, uh, you know, legend, uh, legendary pioneer in, in organizational psychology. Um, yeah, so our ability to be able to uh, detect drift through data and then uh, systematically intervene so it's not reliant on some person, uh, you know, that whole see something, say something, uh, is that we can start to put those measures in place where we can see where that, uh, that drift is, is, is occurring and, and where we need to step in. But we need to be able to articulate what the controls are, what their objectives are, how we plan on testing whether those uh, objectives are being met, and what our performance requirements are. We can't do the, we can't articulate those. You know, we're, we're just kind of tossing a coin when it comes to uh, detecting drift. Yeah, uh, for me, you know, I, I cannot, uh, I don't believe how, I, I don't understand how we can understand where drift is, is present unless we're in, in Rose's world where we're creating the relationships so we, we get the, the conversations that talk about the, the problems that we see and, and the, the deviation from the expected. You know, so, so I, struggle, I struggle with seeing where, where that, is, that is data as opposed to, um, I don't know what I'd call it really, opinion, well, it, I suppose. It, 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 it's got to, it, it, so it's, the difference between data and information is uh, information is data that's been analyzed against a, a specific standard, right? And, and if we've got that information, so again, going back to our mission statement around making risk information accessible and useful to decision makers and to external stakeholders, if you've got that, inf that good quality information, those conversations that you, that you do have and that you encourage uh, but not necessarily just measure blindly, uh, they're going to be much richer uh, to, to be able to help detect that drift. So, so my next question would be then, well, what is the standard that you would measure against? Well, again, because that's, that's... Be ahead, for, for me, that's going, to be, that's going to be work as imagined as opposed to work as done. And, and I think this is where you uh, put in a, uh, a performance requirement, which is not binary. Right. So this is not a, um, you know, I, and I've worked in organizations where we need 100 percent of the people compliant with 100 percent of, of procedures 100 percent of the time. Well, you know, it doesn't that organization doesn't um, employ robots. Right. But so this is where we need to be able to have that uh, understanding of what the, what the performance requirement is uh, and then be comfortable uh, with uh, not having. Uh, 100% performance, 
right? And, and this is where if we can detect failure from successful work, and this is one of the things that we're helping organizations do, we get so much farther down the track in terms of, uh, of operational excellence rather than just waiting for an instant to, to start to collect data. This is probably not in your bailiwick, Michael, but one of the things, for example, uh, in the companies where I've worked where um, is that when drift is detected, uh, deviants, then there's, there's a need to punish people or there's a feeling that you have to have some disciplinary measure attached to that. And then the whole uh, plan falls apart uh, in terms of tracking drift or, or deviance from procedure. Yeah, so I would, I would ask, what was the trigger? What was the detection trigger for drift? Was it an event? Or was it performance uh, information, performance data? It was it was events um, right. because what typically happens is you say, okay, we're all going to agree that there's the cardinal rules, right? There's ten cardinal Oof. rules, and now we're just going to focus on those. So if, if we see anyone or you report anyone on that on one of those cardinal rules, um, then they will be disciplined. Uh, yeah, my. My feeling around rules is um, rather cynical, frankly, uh, when, when it comes to saying, oh, we've got rules, therefore now we've got, um, you know, we've got, we've got a great uh, operation, we've got a great organization. Again, I'm going to go back to, you know, to, to uh, performance of those things that are most important, right? I mean, we, we don't want... Um, you know, nobody wants to be kind of henpecked uh, their way through through their day, right? And you know, tomorrow we talked about uh, Sidney Decker's line around, we need to let people have uh, freedom within a, you know, within a frame. And so, but I want to make sure that if there's any cracks in that frame, that's what we're starting to, to intervene on. Not necessarily what's happening uh, within that, because we know that that is, you know, safe, repeatable, sustainable, but any work outside that frame or that frame starts, the integrity of that frame starts to, to break down, that's where we need to make our uh, our interventions. So uh, yeah, I think for me, rules is um, kind of a lazy managerial out to not understanding uh, what control performance needs to look like uh, and, and how to measure it. Yep. That's very, that's the most common way that it's looked at in my experience. That, that rules are what, sorry, Rosa? Uh, the, uh, the most common way that people try to control is through rules. And, and again, it, it's, yeah, it, it's a, um, it, it's it, like I said, I'll say it again. It was, it, it's a lazy way to, uh, to, to, to manage Right, and, and let's break down the definition of what manage means. Right, manage means to measure, analyze, and improve performance. Whether you're a safety manager, environmental manager, operations manager, financial manager, you need to be able to measure, analyze, and improve. You're not necessarily doing that through rules. You're doing that through controls. Well, that's a cultural shift, right? Tomorrow, you've had your hand up for a while. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We've been having a really great conversation and I know that uh, we're coming up really fast on that hour. It really goes by fast, but uh, we do have people on LinkedIn um, who have joined on the stream and they do have questions for Michael. So I see you there. Thank you so much for joining us on LinkedIn. We have not forgotten you. So uh, Michael uh, SC um, is asking a question to you. Sometimes we find that very knowledgeable employees working in a safe way for years get distracted for a moment, creating unsafe situations. These employees have entered the job after rigorous psychological test and training. I'm not sure what the question was there, but um, any reflections on that statement? Uh, they happen to also be human beings. <laughs> Yes, and 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 there there and, and mistakes are going to errors are going to take place, right? And so I think for me, uh, we need to be able to create. And I'll go back to you know a, a safe, repeatable, and sustainable environment in which work is executed, where we can identify where uh, where error takes place, mm -hmm. retrieve that error, and then also correct for those errors as well. 
So another question that was on there is how you ensure that managers down below uh, down below communicate with last employees and make them comfortable so that they raise even minor safety concerns. Just uh, again, so for, for me, I think it's providing uh, accessible and useful risk information to, to managers around those things that are important. Uh, and that's your the, the critical controls that are mitigating your material and wanted events uh, in the ESG space. If you can keep having conversations around those critical controls and the performance uh, and understanding you know, why and when those controls uh, start to fail, then you're going to have much, um, you know, much better conversations. The, 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 the PPE stuff, the, you know, the housekeeping stuff, the, the, the low level stuff, I don't really want, I, I want to be in a position where we're not measuring that, where people are just, uh, you know, are, are taking actions on the ground as they see fit. Well, I'm gonna pass it back. Do you have any uh, last thoughts that you wanted to share with people before we end today? Oh, I see Philip's hands up. Sorry about that, Philip. I think before me, Su Suzanne has her hand up also, or she did, has gone down now. That's just so, a so, thumbs up. Go for oh, it. Okay. So, yeah. so Suzanne, uh, I, I see you have, uh, your, your comment here um about uh, dr draconian regulations never please uh you know with low rates trump's well-being yeah I, I guess the this is a challenge if, if you get what you ask for you get what you reward uh and and so i think if we can find a way to um you know address the reporting get it done and move on to performance measurement that will be rewarded for, with esg performance measurement by the market, or because we'll be able to demonstrate that we can create and sustain value through ESG functions and differentiate ourselves from our peers. Uh, so whether you're looking for, a, a, your company's looking for a new contract with a, an operator, uh, a, a new project within a jurisdiction, if you can demonstrate that uh, the you are managing you know, ESG risks in a safe, repeatable, sustainable way, you're going to be uh, in pole position to be partner first choice. Yeah, I, I think the E does a great job, but the, um, the, the safety part gets so draconian in order to push those reports out that look good. So what's going all down in here is very rule-based draconian behaviorism. So we can show this cap standard low TIF rate to the world. Uh, I mean, the environmental folks seem to get it and that they seem to be leading this as I'm learning more about it, mostly from you. Um, but the safety world's behind. The safety world doesn't always get this risk management performance-based view that you're bringing. So thank you for that, for sharing. I appreciate it. No, no problem. And I think that the biggest distinction between environment and safety is that environment there's no environmental um, uh, department, that, at least that, that I know of, that has kind of vision zero environmental incidents, right? Like that, that is, that's foolish. Uh, and, and it drives the, the negative behaviors uh, that you know, create these bureaucracies and create this, you know, this cache of really useful, oh, sorry, useless, pardon me, in, uh, information that we share and, and that we communicate outwards. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not professional. So tomorrow, I'm, I'm happy to, to stay on if there are uh, any additional questions. I know we're coming up to the hour mark, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll say thank you very much to, to yourself and Rosa and, and everybody who not only uh, uh, got on the call, but uh, mm -hmm. participated. It was, uh, it was an hour that went by very quickly. Yes, yeah. no, thank you. Philip, did you get to ask your question? Uh, no, I no, I didn't. It was just jump on in there. It's it's just the some of the language that we use and the way it's perceived. And and I've I've come from an industry where and my perception of of the word performance is is focusing on the frontline worker, the man at the pointy end of the stick, and and yet the the biggest those those um, behaviors that have the biggest impact upon 
both the safety and the, the operational success of an organization are those, those, those performance performances, I should say, of some of the senior managers I mean, in some of the trade-offs that they make yeah. and, and, and how those are not, how we don't, as, as industries, we do not manage trade-offs and we don't record them. You know, a decision is made and, and we make a trade-off and that then becomes a, a, a normalization of deviance. And then further down the line, we make another trade-off and, and that makes the system even work even, even less. So my concern is how, how we balance it out because those that make the biggest impact are, are those that are at the top of the, the tree with their, their behaviors, the messages they send out, the, the, the manner in which they manage resources or, or fail to manage resources and so on. So, so, just, so again, just the, the I'll, language I'll, was the concern. Yeah, and, and I'll go back to, to a control environment, right? The control environment in, in, uh, is the, the environment in which the work is being executed. And that control environment is safe, repeatable, sustainable. Um, then you know, that, that's real tr kind of true performance for, for me. But a lot of the decisions that are being made at higher levels of management are going to influence and, and affect uh, that the, the, the performance of the control environment. So, so again, getting back to understanding how well controls are working, uh, understanding where they're failing and why, that's going to trigger a lot of decisions that, that, that by control owners and risk owners who are not necessarily at the sharp end of the stick. Wonderful. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I really appreciate your clarity, Michael. You've really, um, I've learned a lot today. Thank you so much for oh, that. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, this has been a great conversation. Thank you, Michael, for taking the time to join us out of your busy day. And thank you, everybody, for coming to the live session, because if it wasn't for you, there would be no show. So um, on behalf of Safepedia, thank you for your support. Thank you so much, everybody, for showing up. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great Thanks day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.